Hi guys, this is Donald Morton, and I'm at the Anthropology Lab at the University of Arkansas with Dr. Michael Pladkin. And last time we talked about the various hominid skulls, and also a little bit about the foramen magnum, which is the hole that the skull goes up into, and how it shows our ancestors were bipedal. But we have a lot of other evidence for bipedalism, and I just wanted the good doctor to cover some of that. So what do you have for us? Well, last time I talked about the foramen magnum, the hole underneath of the skull, as indicating bipedalism. Um, here you have a chimpanzee, just to remind you. A chimpanzee is a knuckle walker, it is a quadruped, and it walks on its knuckles like this instead of its flat hands. But it does walk quadrupedally. And the head is held out uh, in front of the animal, and so the hole that attaches, where the spine attaches to the base of the skull, is located at the back of the skull. If you look at a modern human, you'll see that that same hole here is located up underneath the skull. More right here. Uh, it would, yeah, it'd be located approximately in a modern human um, to make this thing bipedal. You would shift this thing forward to about here. Now, if you look at the Australopithecines, you'll see comparatively that this hole is actually shifted forward in a characteristic way that's indicative of bipedalism. But for some people, that's not proof of bipedalism. It's suggestive of it, and anatomically and biomechanically, we know that uh, if you know your anatomy well, you'll know that it is indicative of bipedalism, but other people need better evidence to um, convince them that it's bipedal. Now, there's an interesting history behind the uh, discovery of bipedalism, and it really starts with this guy over here, and this is the Piltdown skull. Uh, you'll hear creationists sometimes say that the Piltdown skull was a fraud. It was a fraud. Uh, that So you admit it. Oh, everybody admits it. Everybody knows it. It was scientists who proved that it was a fraud, not the creationists. Um, this thing came at the turn of the century, in the 1900s. So it's a very old, old fraud. And it was found before any of these things were found over here, except Neanderthals. Now, the Piltdown skull was a fraud that was pulled on some people at the British Museum. And the reason that it worked was, before these skulls were found, the first idea that people had about the evolution, about human evolution, is that big brains made us different from other animals, and therefore the big brain would evolve first. And the bipedalism, walking on two legs, would evolve second. Right. We so know they, now that it's the opposite. It's the opposite. That's right. But the first hypothesis, before any uh, uh, fossil record was there, was that the brain would evolve first, and then the upright walking and changes in the skull or the the the, the jaws would occur. Because we like so, to think of intelligence as a defining characteristic, right. so obviously exactly. our ancestors didn't have intelligence. That's right. Too. It came purely from that that we think of ourselves as being very intelligent. Therefore, we think of intelligence as what makes us human. Therefore, intelligence should have evolved first. And it's a logical thing to assume. It's a, it's a hypothesis, right? It can be tested in the fossil record, and it was. But the people at the British Museum, uh, they had a fraud pulled on them, and that was done with this thing, the Piltdown skull. And when it was announced, um, the folks in Britain accepted it, but uh, people in other parts of the world did not necessarily accept it. Uh, there was a question about whether it was real or not. It was very difficult to disprove at the time, because uh, modern dating techniques were not there. Were there newspaper articles saying it was a missing link? Yes. That's what they always say now. That's missing right. Link. Missing link. Well, we missing link. Uh, here are the links. There yeah. is no missing link. Okay, we got. It. Okay, <laughs> they're right well, here. What about the links between these? Between them. Uh, that's the classic too. Now you've got even more missing links, right? <laughs> that's well. If you, you want to buy that argument, that I just can't argue with you. You need a fossil from every creature <laughs> that ever lived. Exactly. Um, it's silly scientifically. It's like trying to prove that this table is not made of atoms because you can't see every atom in the table. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, Piltdown Man um, uh, was proven to be a fraud, but it played on this idea that brain should evolve first and that bipedalism would evolve second. Now, Piltdown eventually was proven to be a fraud. The last nail in the coffin of this thing as a fraud was done in the 1950s, but in fact, by the 1930s, it was considered suspicious and pushed off to the side by people because we got a better fossil record. And that fossil record started in South Africa with this little guy, which is called the Tong Child. Tong Child has, this is not a fossilized brain, but it's a mineral infill of the brain case. This thing was found in a cave where there's breccia or lime works. And uh, miners were mining for uh, stalagmites, literally. Uh, Why they need stalagmites? They burn it from uh, smelting gold. And so they went into these caves and blasted this stuff out. And they also blasted out all these fossils. Well, one of them found one of these fossils, and they took it to Raymond Dart down in, 19, in the early 1920s. Uh, to the anatomy department at Vitz University in Johannesburg, South Africa. And Dart recognized this thing as, as uh, related to humans. And he recognized it on the basis of the teeth, which looked more like humans than apes. 
and on the basis of the position of the frame and magnum, which you'll notice it actually doesn't have, but he made an inference about where that was on the basis of the structure of the brain in here. And he this is fascinating because you can actually see the veins oh, yeah. and the indentation. <laughs> it's in the really brain. cool. And yeah, it's just uh, handling it uh, uh, back in January with a real specimen, and you can really see this stuff very clearly on uh, the real thing, much better actually than on the cast. But the uh, uh, Raymond Dart inferred that this thing walked on two legs. Now, initially, when he announced this in, 19, in the mid-1920s, um, the Europeans, who had not seen the fossils, um, just said, well, it's just an ape. It's just a baby. You know, it's a juvenile ape. And indeed, it is a kid. It's not an adult. And uh, Dart made his case, and the acceptance of this thing as the missing link was um, tentative. Right? Some people believed it, some people did not, right up until the 1930s. Uh, Dart collected these things, and there was a lot of debate and argument about these things. It was not widely accepted as uh, bipedal because we only had this one specimen. It was a juvenile, and it's only fragmentary and partial, and so it was easy for people who hadn't seen the specimen to simply dismiss it. It's really like the creationists. The, uh, he had a colleague there named uh, Robert Broom, and Robert Broom went out, and Robert Broom found this in the 1930s. And so, uh, also, Apithecus africanus was found, and it ended all debate about whether this thing. So this is uh, an adult version of. Yes, this is an adult. Show. That's right. This is an adult version of this thing. Right here. And when Robert Broom, you found actually this, have the form then that. people conceded it. Yes, they did. More importantly, Robert Broom went out and he found this, and this is the pelvis. And the pelvis tells us whether we're walking on two legs or not. Now, the pelvis um, of a human differs from that of a chimp. Very, very clearly. If we just move over here and take a look, I've got sure. a chip skeleton over here, and I've got a human pelvis. This is a human pelvis. Oriented naturally, it sits about like this. Um, we've got the socket for the, the femur coming in here. Here's the pubis bone up in the front. And here's the lower back here. And what you'll notice about the lower back is that it's curved. It has what we call the lumbar lordosis. You have a curved lower back. You can feel it on your own lower back. It's going to switch places with you. Causes all sorts of back problems. Herniated discs happen here. It's actually a pretty bad design. It works, but it causes a lot of problems. Bad design in a human body? Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, anybody with a herniated disc is going to regret that design. Uh, and it works like squishing a donut. Um, these discs in here, because the thing is curved and tilted, uh, they bear the weight not easily and uniformly, but they squish it out the front. And so what tends to happen is the disc collapses. And in fact, the entire arch here can break and the backbone can separate off the sacrum. Now, is this homo sapiens? This is a modern homo. homo how, how would you have designed that part? Uh, straight up and down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not curving. It. So not the problem curving. is that it's curving at the bottom. And that's right. Down. Because effectively, it's a quadrupedal animal that's simply standing upright. And the way that it stands upright is it just bends the lower back to stand mm -hmm. upright. But ancestrally, it didn't stand up right, so no. it probably evolved that way before. It was a That's problem. right. Ancestrally, this is like any other quadrupedal animal. It has all the same features of any other quadruped, monkey, ape, and dog, cat, anything you want, except that it stands upright and curves. Now, there's a few modifications of this thing to help it out. It still does work. You know, it may not be the best design, but it does work, and there are changes that are associated with this. And the first thing you'll notice is, let's compare it to a chimpanzee over here. Now, the chimpanzee, we've got him standing upright a little bit here. Uh, chimpanzees are quadrupedal, so normally they actually walk with their back more parallel to the ground. But let's look at the chimpanzee pelvis right here. And the first thing is, look at these blades right here. From the camera over there, they're probably actually hard to see because on the end side, on the side. But you'll see that they're long and they're broad, but they also face on the animal's body right, like the this. The flat part is they're facing flat. the front. That's right, the flat part is facing the front. And there would be muscles behind them. That's right. The muscles, the gluteal muscles, right, your butt muscles, attach back here and back to the back of the leg, and they pull the leg out to the side. So your gluteus maximus, your gluteus medius, the minimus muscles, they run to the back over here. If you look at the human, which walks on two legs, you'll see that the uh, blades here face more forward. Right? They're broader and they're shorter than that of the great ape. Right? It's very, very visually obvious. Just look at that and compare it, and you'll start to see the differences are very, very clear. Another thing you'll notice is the sacrum. That's the part where the pelvis attaches. In the ape, the sacrum is narrow. Right? So we'll just roll that around, and you'll see this narrow sacrum right here where the pelvis attaches. Is that and where the pelvis attaches to the spine? That's right, where the pelvis attaches to the spine. The sacrum is part of the spine. And that sacrum on the, on the chimpanzee is very narrow. Here's the same structure right here. The sacrum on 